right. Uh, so we're going to go. Oh, so there, it, was, it was off. Now it's on. All right. So we're going to get started. Uh, I'm just going to uh, do a couple things. The first is uh, I would love for the people who came in after we did the stories and have not yet introduced themselves to just say your name and uh, just to come up and introduce yourself and say where you're from. So I know a couple of you are sitting here, so you can start. Hi everyone, my name is Megan Carney. I use she, her, and hers pronouns. I'm here from Chicago, Illinois, representing Rivendell Theater Ensemble. Glad to be with all of you. Um, hi, my name is Tara Mallon. I'm the artistic director at Rivendell Theater Ensemble, and Megan and I, um, over the last six years, have been building a project about women in the military called Women at War. Uh, great, who else? Greetings, my name is Umoja Abdul Ahad, and I'm helping Carpetbag Theater celebrate its 47th anniversary, moving into the 50th coming in 2019. So we're looking forward to that. <laughs> great. Uh, who else joined us here? Great. Hi, my name is Bart Pitchford. I'm a PhD student at UT Austin. I'm also a veteran from the US, uh, US Army with uh, deployments to Iraq, Yemen, and Pakistan. Great to be here, and thank you all for discussing this. Hi, I'm Kenna Carpenter. I'm a faculty member at University of Texas at Austin. Oh, you already did. Anybody else? Uh, David House? Oh, and one more down there, yeah. Great. And I'm David House, the executive director here at Arts Emerson. Good evening to everyone. I'm Nolan Bivens, uh, just an old soldier. And um, I basically uh, work with the National Initiative for Arts and Health in the Military, and I'm really happy to be with you. Thank you. Uh, great. Did I get everyone? Great. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to do one reminder before we start. Uh, so this, we're going to have a conversation amongst ourselves. Uh, the inner table here is going to, we're just going to talk to each other, so you don't need to lean back or out or in any other direction, but to each other like you're at the dinner table. Um, and then, uh, but you're going to do it with a microphone so that the outer circle can hear you and the live streaming can hear you. So the uh, important, important part of this for it to be successful is that the outer circle has to actively listen. So no side conversations out here, ideally no phoning or that kind of thing uh, as best you can. Uh, and, um, uh, and so to actively listen and then we're going to talk for 45 minutes here and then we're going to break up and then we're going to talk to all together for 45 minutes. So as you're actively listening, you're going to have comments, thoughts, questions, and you'll have a chance to uh, bring those into the, uh, into the room after we're done talking here. Okay, great. Uh, and I have microphones that you can pick up there. So I'm going to hold on to mine. Uh, so I um, um, am going to have you introduce yourself at the same time that you do the first question so, uh, for, so that we can keep things flowing. Uh, I'm, a big, um, uh, I'm a big sports fan, so I watch this show called Pardon the Interruption, and uh, uh, it's a very important show in my life, and that show, um, you get like a certain time frame to do something and then you're interrupted, right? Uh, so um, we're going to run this very first prompt like Pardon the Interruption. So I'm going to time you, you get one minute to talk about your project, the specific thing that you're working on. Um, and if there are two of you from a team, I suppose you each get a minute. So um, I suppose that's cheating, but I'm, you know, I'm cool with that. Um, and so uh, you're each going to get a minute. I'm actually going to time you and I'm going to stop you at a minute. Okay, so it's nerve wracking, um, but exciting. All right, so um, that's how we're going to go. Uh, I have my timer. and. Uh, Anybody feel ready to start with the prompt and then if you would say your name and then just talk about your spe the specific work you've been doing in 60 seconds. Uh, the prompt is to talk about the specific work that you're sitting at the table for for 60 seconds. Yeah, okay, so Marty's gonna go. Don't push it yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Is this thing on? Yeah, okay. Hey everybody, Marty Pottinger, uh, living in Portland, Maine for the last 10 years and running something called Art at Work, which I started um, years ago. And the project we've been doing with the vets is a couple projects, it's called All the Way Home. And one is uh, performances, story exchanges, and they happen where the vets are rather than bringing them. So a university vets club, a uh, post a uh, get gathering, a get together, a holiday celebration. The other project is um, a comic books writing uh, a comic book 
a personal comic book with vets who've served in Iraq and Afghanistan who are battling PTSD about how they are winning that battle. And it's about their life story. It goes very young and very old in their experiences. And they each work with a comic book artist. And it's something that will ultimately be online. And they can have copies. And we want to do one with their children and some of their spouses as well. And then the last one is a listening wall. Great, thank you, and um, uh, that was great. It was great modeling. Just to remember, even though you have a microphone, we're still talking to each other. It's very hard to do. The microphone makes you want to talk to everyone. Um, okay, so uh, who's next up? Want to go around? Yeah, let's sure, pass sure. it around. Hey, everybody. I'm Megan Carney. I'm here from Chicago, um, where I do a variety of things, but I'm an ensemble member with Rivendell Theater Ensemble. We're, we're an equity professional company. We've been around for 22 years, and we focus on advancing women through the arts, so we have a really particular kind of lens around gender um, and other social justice kind of frameworks. And we have a project called Women at War, which we started several years ago. It's based on interviews with over 75 women who served and deployed in recent combat and came back to tell their stories. And we developed this through a series of community partnerships, story circles, interviews, and created a main stage show for our um, production season a few years back. And now we have a show that tours. And each show is accompanied by a town hall discussion where uh, we have veterans and civilians talking to each other. And it's really about raising visibility for women veterans who are often invisible in the stories that we tell um, in, when, we, when we think about veterans and trying to connect them with support services. Great, take it. <clears throat> uh, my name is Tara Mallon and I am a colleague of Megan's. I'm the artistic director at Rivendell Theater Ensemble and she just gave a lot of my backstory. So I'll just uh, tell you a little bit more about the Women at War project and its genesis, which was uh, in 2009, I was asked to direct a show, a workshop at DePaul University. And I walked into the room and there were these 10 beautiful young BFA students. And um, they said I could devise anything I wanted. So I brought in Helen Benedict's book, The Lonely Soldier, which was interviews of, with women coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. and. Um, it, we, the first day they were all talking like, yeah, um, oh my God, like, so one, so I just don't even understand like why a girl would even, you know, like enlist. And I thought, wow, we have a problem and uh, we need to start addressing it. And then flash forward, we ended up with a grant through the Chicago Community Trust to develop the, the program, but that was really it, the seat moment for it. Great, thank you. We're going around, okay. I'm Victoria Marks, and I'm based in Los Angeles. And back in 2003, when we invaded oh, when we invaded Iraq, um, I felt like I, I wanted to know what it would be like to be a choreographer who was a citizen artist. And so I began to um, just look for. I don't have veterans in my family, so to be, open up conversations. And gradually, we have a very big. Um, VA hospital in West LA and um, I went over there to the combat rehab program and gradually, gradu gradually I developed um, a project that was what I called an action conversation and the idea was to bring a group of veterans into a room with a group of non-veterans, in fact these were graduate students, dancer, choreographers at UCLA where I worked and that we would have a productive conversation, both in sharing certain experiences of our training and physicality, but also with so much to learn from one another. And the idea behind the action conversation was to move and then talk, and then move and then talk. Great. And the moving always came from the talking, and the talking always came from the moving. And Great. gradually, after 15 weeks, we made a performance. Great, thank you. Great. Why am I so nervous? <laughs> I know, well, and we're all here, but they're all there. Um, my name is Roman Baca, Exit 12 Dance Company. Um, I'm a classical ballet dancer who joined the Marine Corps and served in Fallujah, Iraq. Um, I'm interested in work that explores the human experience, particularly the combat experience and the experience of the military and how combat affects everyone associated with it. Um, through Exit 12, I've been able to explore that in a number of ways. We've developed a repertoire of work that talks about the military experience from all angles. The two projects that I'm working on currently, one is to bring four women together and 
have them, have them go through their experiences and see what movement develops. Um, I want to kind of step away from the classical ballet paradigm. Um, the second one is a project that was done, that is going to be done in the UK uh, with UK military, ex Iraqi military, looking at developing a brand new Rite of Spring based on the military experience. Hi, my name is Joe Good, and uh, I'm the artistic director of a company called the Joe Good Performance Group. Um, a few years ago, I got really tired of my own voice. I write all of my own work, and I thought it would be interesting to interview my friends, uh, the ones who didn't die of AIDS, the ones who were left, about the challenges of you know being who they are in life, and use those words verbatim to make a performance. I ended up being a series of performances, which we call the Humankind series, and I had all these elaborate questions at first, and then ultimately I had one question, which was, what do you do when you fall down to get back up? And that morphed into the Resilience Project. A very smart curator friend of mine asked me to do that project with veterans, and I did. Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Peter Snow, and I'm a playwright, and I live here in Boston. About five years ago, a good friend of mine uh, gave me a book as a, as a holiday gift called Call to Serve, Stories of Men and Women Confronting the Vietnam War Draft. It was a collection of about 30 interviews uh, of people who had different responses to the draft. Some uh, resisted, some went to Canada, some uh, went the, you know, uh, answered the call to serve, were drafted, went to Vietnam. Um, uh, some were conscientious objectors, so forth. So, and he rather glibly said, okay, Peter, why don't you make a play out of that? I was like, okay, and I did. So, um, uh, let's see. Um, so the play has four uh, vets in it, uh, three combat vets and a nurse who um, served in Vietnam as a fi in a field hospital. All of them had PTSD. Um, and we, premiered the play here in Boston, took it on the road for three performances in Massachusetts and uh, Connecticut. Um, and then we actually raised the money to film um, the live performance in Boston, and it's now out on video through a play thing called the Media Education Foundation, which distributed documentary um, uh, films to colleges and universities Great. primarily. Thank you. Hi, my name is Helen Stoltzfus. I'm co-artistic director of Black Swan Arts and Media uh, in Oakland, California. We um, create and produce our own work that travels beyond the borders of race, religion, politics, ethnicity. Last year, my creative partner, Albert Greenberg, and I created um, over, we had worked for several years collecting interviews. Uh, we created and produced a piece called a performance event actually called um, The Prepared Table, a feast of foods, live performance and stories from Iraq, Afghanistan and the FOB, Forward Operating Base of the US Military. Yes, it's a very long title. Um, we had 100 people uh, seated at tables like this, 10 to a table, and um, we fed them a feast of traditional foods from Iraq Afghanistan and uh, a typical military base. Interwoven throughout the evening were um, videos of actual interviews with Iraqi and Afghan refugees and US military veterans who had fought in Iraq and Afghanistan and live performances with hip hop dancers, jazz musicians, acrobats, Quranic chanter, Afghan traditional singer. Great. We, yes. Great, thank you, great. Hi, my name is Tel Castellanos. I am a uh, theater maker and um, artistic director of the, the Combat Hippies. Uh, Victoria, you actually reminded me that, that I had been doing this work before I started doing this work. Uh, in 2003, I was commissioned to write and direct um, a, a, a hip hop uh, dance theater piece. And, I, and that's right around the time of the invasion. And, and I chose, I, I, I created a piece called Scratch and Burn. Uh, which was uh, my response to our invasion of, of Iraq. Um, I, and I, I, don't f I don't think I necessarily fall into anything. I think things just kind of unfold the way they do. 
uh, even sitting at this table here today. Um, but I was uh, contracted to teach a spoken word workshop um, to, uh, to Iraq uh, war veterans. And uh, we created, we actually ended up creating a uh, theater piece called uh, Conscious on the Fire, which we are currently uh, touring and have been awarded the uh, Knight Grant Foundation to create a new piece, which I'll let him finish the other minute and talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Two for one. Um, I'm Anthony Torres. I am uh, the executive director slash co-founder slash performer with the Combat Hippies. Um, uh, I'm also a social worker, and as um, the school I went to taught this trauma-informed curriculum based off of the work of Bessel van der Kolk, talking about, um, you know, the, the, his book is The Body Keeps the Score, and with the theater work that Teo taught us, um, it gives us a venue to share our stories, uh, incorporate um, performance, and um, it's not only had a great impact on us, but also others. So our new project, uh, is to incorporate, uh, to record oral histories of Iraqi refugees along with fellow combat veterans um, and try to give a uh, more well-rounded narrative to the experience of war and its impact, but also to resiliency and healing. Great. Uh, so thank you for that and for indulging that. It's a great way uh, for, um, yeah, you were exactly at a minute. That was very <laughs> impressive. Uh, that was very impressive. But thank you for that. It, it's a way to get everybody's voice in the room uh, right from the get-go uh, in a short period of time and just to hear from all of you. So we'll take a more uh, relaxed approach to our conversation now. Um, but uh, yes. Yes, I, I, I find moderating panels that sometimes uh, not everybody gets to even get into the conversation, and so that's an important way to start. So, um, so I'm wondering if uh, we could um, just toss around the question. I mean, what you know, we, we've put this convening together. That clearly there's something unique about working um, as artists in uh, communities with active military and veterans, and and just wondering what are the key strategies for doing that work, what makes it different for you as artists, and um, if you might talk a little bit about that and you can get deeper into your specific projects that way. And there are three mics around, so. Yeah, so if, so we, I, I was saying we put this, uh, convening together because clearly there's something unique about artists coming together with veterans and active military that is um, something that uh, I think we often think of the arts and the military as things that live in in different poles of the world, and clearly you've um, uh, managed to bridge that pole. And so, what are some of the key strategies you've used to bridge that pole, and and some of the kind of key learnings that have come out of your work uh, specifically in this area? Uh, I'll jump in, Helen Stoltzfus. Food. So if you feed people, they will come. And something happens when people are sitting around a table eating food. So people you know, uh, civilians, military, atheists, Jews, Muslims, people who were f strongly for the war, people who were strongly against the war, Iraqi refugees, Afghan refugees, all these people live in the Bay Area, that's what's amazing. Military personnel are all seated together at a table sharing food and because it's a table, there's protocol around that. So you introduce yourself, and, you know, you pass food, you maybe talk to each other, which is so different than sitting in a you know, in an auditorium and everybody's facing the stage, but you don't relate to the to each other. And so relating to each other was an important part of the, for some people it was the most powerful part of the experience was who they sat with. My favorite table was a table where there were vets of Iraq and Afghanistan sitting with Iraqi and Afghan refugees and they talked to each other and they exchanged contact information. So there, I think that's, that's a really critical part for us. It was. Um, I just to, uh, I love, I had written down earlier the idea of the shared meal, and one of the things that uh, we were doing um, with Women at War that I just basically stole from the Theater of War folks, which was this amazing sort of template on how to use the theater piece as the catalyst to the conversation, was kind of making sure, really ensuring that the um, audience was intentionally comprised of both civilians and military folks so that there could be, in fact, a conversation 
our project, Megan, um, when we developed it, we really wanted that, that town hall to be a huge part of the experience and not just an add-on, like for the 10 people that stay after the production, but really be a, a piece of it. And when, during the town halls, when we were successful in making sure that it was like 50-50 in our 50-seat house, so that's 25 and 25, um, the conversations that erupted were really stunning. And I, just to, Harken back to what was just said in the Liz Lerman thing, which was so amazing. It's about um, bringing it in together and sort of blurring those lines so that so that we can actually speak to each other. You know. Comment. Um, I was a mental health tech in the Army for four years. Uh, I was a psych tech in the Miami VA Medical Center for almost five years. And I, I hosted an open mic, I think it was 2013. Um, when this project was presented, I just thought with my personal love of writing that this is an untapped resource in the veteran community, or at least in my community in South Florida. And um, I found myself kind of going to every little poetry workshop and presentation and book reading. Um, and when this opportunity came up to have a writing workshop for vets, I just felt you know, using this as a tool um, can complement, you know, how therapy and medication help so many people, but what else is there? If, if therapy is talking, talking is expression, then there's other ways to express yourself. And um, that's been a really powerful tool and we try to encourage fellow vets to do that. And um, it's, it's, it's been a great, uh, great experience so far. You are asking about techniques? Yeah, strategies, um, learning, things that you've done. I mean, what I'm just, so I'm hearing, you know, bringing people, civilians and military veterans together is one strategy, food is a strategy, workshops, are, I mean, so just trying to kind of get as much into the table as we can here, so. Um, I can tell you what not to do. Um, <laughs> I, I, and I'll preface this, right? So um, in my 10 years of work that I've been in this space, I, being totally honest, I felt kind of an imposter in both worlds in both the artistic world and in the veteran world. And I thought that I could make it a little more um, authentic and a little more honest and a little more safe by first making the work autobiographical. So most of our beginning works were experiences that happened to me or my unit or um, things that we experienced or things that people close to me experienced um, that I had permission to use. Um, and then when we started working with other veterans that I hadn't met before, uh, we tricked them into coming and working with us. And I use the word tricked. Um, they were coming to do a writing workshop, they thought, and they ended up dancing. Um, and then they ended up performing, right? So uh, now looking back at 10 years and looking where I'm going next and the new projects I'm going on, I think this is the first time I've felt that I've actually developed the tools and techniques to approach a project the way I think is an uh, is the I don't want to say correct um, is okay with me of, of approaching a project from a place of knowledge and a place of wisdom with the tools needed to and the structure. Thank you, Liz, um, to actually do something that I can be proud of. I don't know if that helps, but yeah, super helpful. I'm thinking about um, timeline, you know, and being really realistic about the time it takes to do something like this because um, just underscoring, we've heard throughout the day people talking about credibility and we're all talking about relationship building and that does take time. And um, in my experience, you know, we would have really successful workshops where you go in and you meet somebody, but you're just like, I would just feel like we're just scratching the surface, you know, we're not, because we don't know each other yet. So why would you tell me the truth about your experience unless I show up next time you know, and I share a little bit more about myself, and then we have a relationship, and then we're building together, and then eventually, you know, our storytellers got to decide whether or not they wanted, what they wanted to contribute, and how they wanted to tell it, but there was a relationship there by the time we got around to a recorder or saying, you know, this is gonna be in a show. And um, that was a big learning lesson because, you know, we submitted it for a grant, and we were like, all right, we're on the grant timetable, and you know, it just, it just didn't happen like that, you know? So then we were like, oh, okay, let's circle back and figure out, and, you know, and it turned in from, you know, it turned into like five years of getting off the ground. Um, and it was worth it. 
Um, and I'm also um, thinking about how, um, you know, just doing, like I had done oral history projects in um, like a, what I would call like subcultures, you know, before. And for me, a lot of it was like really honoring, um, you know, veteran culture military culture and veteran culture as a culture that I didn't know much about and sort of owning my ignorance around that and doing a lot of education and asking questions when I didn't know and um, uh, just sort of entering the space like that and then building, my, building on the information so that I could, you know, be a different kind of collaborator and participant in the room. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think this work, more than any, but maybe every work, is there's a the importance of figuring out how to trust your own thinking and make your own mistakes. Uh, and that it is the only way you kind of get to learn what there is to learn as you go forward. Um, a couple things I've thought about while doing it, um, and one is we don't have a professional mental health person present, even though very intense things are shared. And I think making sure that the reality of mental health professionals is, is clear and available and spoken and shared. But one thing I think I learned the hard way was to not have story exchanges in a traditional mental health facility, to actually do it in the VFW post, to do it at the retirement home, to do it at the events, at the, this and that. Um, just because it's, it's, it's opening a door that we're not actually trying to open for that, right? And um, another thing was, oh, the power of listening to really structuring it so that the vets were helping each other, like really making that clear and they know that, but just to make it quite clear that you're listening to this other one's stories, actually you are doing the buddy-buddy helping thing. And so that the vets are clear that this is a vets helping vets project. Um, and so I think that was helpful. Um, and the, the demographics, um, I had a couple events that we had really key people who were in support of the project that couldn't come to a workshop because we would have too many non-vets. And the people who came, everyone had to agree to participate um, as themselves. And that was awkward to set up with the people involved, but they did a group, it was one of our congresswoman, you know, that kind of thing. We're usually not having those kind of conversations. Uh, it's usually something done with the staff, but I really felt like I needed the congresswoman to personally agree to participate fully and deeply. Um, and then the last one is just the importance for us, a balance of attention. So, um, and for me, I mean, to not, it was, it was, important how deep the vets wanted to go and how little they felt they had space to tell the kinds of stories they were sharing. Um, and they went there sometimes very quickly, but the way they were invited and the way it was set up was to be like, what's your funniest story? What's the longest wait you had? What's your MRE story? What's your um, buddy that you'll never, you know, that you still stay in touch with story, that kind of thing. So to really uh, make sure that that's, um, just embedded and kind of integrated in the entire process. Um, I want to add uh, yes to everything. And I wanted to add, just add another thought, which I, is a little hard to parse quickly, but um, I wanted to talk about resistance. And um, very often we think of resistance as like a, a door closing. Uh, I think of resistance as an incredibly ac um, active form of participation. and. Um, and that if you're listening really closely, um, it's not a door closing. It's actually one of the most fervent ways of, of saying what's going on. And um, an example just of that, and uh, another huge learning moment for me is that um, always after food, um, this vet says, you know, he starts reminiscing or remember, remembering the smell of flesh burning in the oil fires in Kuwait. And, um, and his friend says, stop it, don't do that. That we do in therapy, we don't do this here. And I, I'm only listening and I'm quiet and then I say, is it that Manuel can't tell this story or is it the story can't be told? And the other guy goes, gee, I don't know. 
And so I think that always being a good listener and a respectful listener, but also um, not letting a moment that seems to be emphatic or door shutting be a door shut. It's actually a door opening to a whole deeper understanding about what's really going on. That's great. Uh, anybody else want to add to that who hasn't added? Uh, a couple of things that I think are coming up around um, uh, the table. I think one is that question of, I, I wonder um, in terms of uh, building trust, how, um, like, is it different? I mean, as artists, we're, we know trust is a key part of the creative process, right? Um, but trust inside of, um, you know, and I, I think, Megan, you're talking about oral, you know, doing oral history projects, like we, we've all probably done some version of that. H how does this differentiate, in ter in, and is that related to trauma? Is that related to um, the military being so far away from um, artistic practice more generally? Or what, what are, you know, wh how do you identify um, the challenges of building trust in in, um, in, the, in, in, in military and veteran communities. I think one, if you talk about motives, um, both your own uh, for wanting to be involved with these stories um, and somehow reveal your own vulnerability in that and then ask the person that you're doing the oral history with what was what their motive for mm -hmm. wanting to tell the story? Is it really gives them agency? It gives them a sense of purpose, and they can uh, address what they want to address and come at it from the angle they want to come at it from. And also, I mean, I, I think of the larger project for me, it, beyond understanding veterans and their experience, is how can we be compassionate with each other as human beings, and when I express that motive and say, I think you have something to teach me and others because of your experience, um, it gives them a lot of power and allows them to shape how they want to deliver that message. I think building on that idea, I think it's like that question, you know, what do you, what do you want people to know that they don't know, you know, or what's not out there? and, and um, we encountered multiple times in workshops or talking with people if you would say like well What are the stereotypes people have about women veterans? Oh? Man <laughs> you would like open up the door to like these brainstorms and all these um, You know ideas that circulate in our culture about you know who veterans are and who women veterans are and you know and um, the women that we were working with were very aware of that and um, I often felt like acknowledging that that was out there and you know there were some things that showed up in every one of those conversations but acknowledging that that's out there these misperceptions are there kind of freed up the room and allowed us to be in on it like all right well let's get beyond that then or let's even get beyond the statistics you know right like let's kind of get to a deeper kind of truth and um, that was a way in for us that um, helped kind of build that sense and and maybe because some of those narratives are so pervasive and, and, there, and there is a code of silence around certain things that we kind of had to break through that. And I, f I did feel like that was a little bit different. You know, that did feel unique um, to this project. Um, I have a couple other questions about um, this question of, uh, as I'm listening, you know, uh, I, I think often artists think that they understand the full range of human emotion uh, and uh, um, and so we have great confidence in our ability to tell stories that are you know um, uh, you know emotional and intense and and I was just thinking about uh, watching out um, uh, watching Liz and her project and what an emotional experience that was and how those stories are um, you know um, not as familiar as other kinds of stories. And I was thinking about you, Marty, saying that you don't have somebody who's a trauma person in the room. Um, and, and I just wonder about like that relationship between um, like how you manage this experience of trauma in your, in your various artistic practice or you know, are there moments that you have felt in over your head uh, with the work in any way or, um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of curious about that. 
You know, uh, something that happened early on is when we originally when we originated the project, we were working with um, a, a, a service organization called VetCat, which was Veterans Creative Arts Therapy. And about a year into it, when we started getting ready to do the initial interviews, it was with a therapist in the room who really, um, really didn't allow the vets to talk to us directly. She was the sort of the conduit, do you know what I mean? And it was, um, it, it really, and it felt like we were being pitted against the, the vets in a very strange, subtle, kind of insidious way. Yes, like she was protecting the vets from us, which I think didn't help them trust that we were in it for the long haul or about motivation, about what our motivation, why we were doing this. Uh, it wasn't helping. And then once we kind of moved away from that and Megan led this amazing story circle, although, you know, Tanisha is also a counselor, just a very different, but it was with um, 15 of us and Megan had us tell our s stories too. We began by telling a story as well. And then all of a sudden it was like the dam opened you know, but we had also been kicking around with it for two years at that point. And the veterans within the community had been seeing us showing up at these different events. And you know, it's like, I think they just needed to trust that we were not going to be going away. But it was really interesting to me, like we weren't going to go away. Um, and then uh, it was interesting to me how once that one person was sort of removed from the room and we were able to sort of deal with each other one-on-one -on -one and build these individual relationships. And then, then they started to trust us with their stories in a really interesting way that I've never completely unpacked why that happened that way. You know. And I just say that the people charged who are working in the mental health system with vets, and we all know this, but they are on the front line in a very real way. And so it totally makes sense that yeah. they will throw themselves on some metaphorical real version of a hand grenade in order to you know, keep the vets from being hurt or traumatized or re-somethinged. Re, re um, uh, so it's, uh, this is a good topic to, no, to of, tap on. A lot of people right now, a, a lot of people want to, there's a lot of funding in and around working within the veterans communities. And I think a lot of folks are trying to have maybe maybe in some situations, certainly in Chicago, I have heard that there have been people who have been abusing that opportunity and maybe not in it for the long haul or maybe have questionable motivations. And so I think it makes the veterans community very sort of like keeping folks at arm's length for a oh, bit. Chicago. Oh, Chicago. Oh, Chicago. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Just a quick comment on the trust issue, and I think there's a real difference between um, being trusted uh, with the story that you're given, but then there's that another element of trust, which is how it's presented on stage. And I, I made a really a bad blunder. Well, I, it wasn't all, all me, but we had one vet um, uh, who was in and out of the project. I wasn't sure he wanted to have his story in the play. Um, and he eventually said he would. Um, and then a, there was a scene in which he has kind of a flashback um, and uh, to his combat experience. And how that represented physically on the stage was a question. And the director I was working with wanted him to sort of have a, get on his knees and kind of scuttle to one side of the stage. Um, I wasn't sure about it. We went with it, and in fact, um, Al Levet, concerned um, for his own reasons, decided he didn't want to come see the play anyway. It, but I, I got feedback that um, somebody was pretty upset that we had represented that, knowing Al being an incredibly resilient person who goes into schools and talks about his bad experience, um, even though it re-traumatizes him. So he's a very brave and resilient guy, and this was not a good representation of him. And um, when we filmed the play, we actually took that scene out of the film. But I, it was a big lesson for me. It's like it's not only about having someone trust you with their story, but trust you to represent it in a way that feels right and, and authentic to them. So. 
I, I, I want to speak to uh, what you said earlier, t uh, Tara, um, in reference to telling your story. Um, that's that's uh, one of the things that um, uh, that I did, and, and and looking for ways how I can relate uh, to these veterans on on a, on a different level, right? right? And um, because it, you know, this the divide does exist, right? Uh, military veterans and, and civilians, and and we know it exists and and is there, but the, but there's there are other commonalities, and and. Um, we would talk about things like uh, we most of us were Puerto Rican actually uh, who grew up in the states and so we you know that was part of our commonality uh, there was we talked about our fathers uh, and how in our relationships with our fathers and and through these conversations uh, the structure of the piece came about which was um, I said let's do childhood military service and post military service and uh, it was these childhood experiences that, that really uh, connected us mm -hmm. and, and made us relate to each other. And, and, and you know, and my story is, is not the story of a veteran, but it, it you know, has its own um, uh, struggles and trauma. That's right. And drama and trauma. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Part two. Um. <laughs> We met with Te I met with Teo before. We did a four-month uh, writing workshop through Miami-Dade College Live Arts Department. Um, we met before the workshop, which was going to be a weekly workshop for four months. Four veterans showed up, including myself, which I ended up forming the hippies. Um, but we, we talked, and he's kind of like, I am not familiar with this at, at all. You know, how do I approach this? Um, when they mentioned his name for the workshop, I said, Teo who? I did my research, and when we met, I was like, your reputation precedes yourself. Like, I, I know who you are, I know the work you do, and um, I feel it will really gel well with, with the group because one of the hippies is a relative of mine, the other two were friends. So as we um, started aligning commonalities versus differences, um, uh, it, it really started coming together. And one thing that I loved about Teo's approach was that it was like hands-on but hands-off at the same time. He was kind of like molding us and crafting, and when a story came up, he would find a commonality and say, let's explore that more, or you know, he would kind of guide us. And that gave us a sense of freedom and kind of autonomy, um, but also you know, with his experience and direction. Um, what I really grasped the most was what he mentioned was, the universality of the emotions and feelings of the experiences, that that is what everyone can relate to. Pain and loss and hurt and suffering, and also growth and resiliency, um, and this idea of that sharing stories brings us closer together. I just want to say that they call me Papa Hippie now. <laughs> um, you asked about uh, failures or yeah. mistakes, and um, I think I've so far completely failed in actually moving things forward on military sexual trauma, and so that's primarily with women. So they'll tell me a story, and then I'll never see them again, or they won't. They'll, you know, that was my story. Thank you so much. Please don't use my name. Um, and so it's such a key issue, and I obviously think I have a picture of why that doesn't get to the page or the stage at this point, but I'm wondering if anyone here has thoughts about it, especially you two, maybe. Yeah, I was sitting here thinking about that. It's interesting you brought that up. Um, you know, we, uh, part of that, I was saying that grant timeline earlier, we um, did a workshop, public performance at, uh, we had a university um, collaborator in Chicago at UIC, University of Illinois Chicago. And um, so we did a public workshop of, the, of what we had so far. And they were like the just scratching the surface stories, but we had like standing room only crowd. You know, we had a lot. For 60 and 160, 160 people showed up. It was like, the, we're just horrifying. fabulous. <laughs> fabulous and horrifying. A public, veterans, civilians, yeah, and just a lot of community parts, really fantastic. And we, it was like a huge artistic risk because we were so aware of what it wasn't, you know? It was just nascent, right? Mm. Okay. 
So um, that, uh, what, but what was great about taking that risk is there were a lot of veterans there who um, watched it and saw with us what wasn't there. And then because we did the town hall, um, a lot of women came to us after that and said, this is missing, this is missing, this is missing, this is missing. And that was like the greatest failure that turned into like the greatest gift, you know, because, because we took the risk to put it out there before it was done, we invited that community and like all good audiences, right, during previews or whatever, to come into it and say, here's what I see, here's what I wanna see, you know. And um, after that, stories about um, military sexual assault or military sexual trauma started um, coming to us with permission to use it and, and nuanced stories. So not just like this happened, but also women spoke to us about how they handled it, and, you know, how they looked out for each other, like accommodations that were made or decisions that got made or things that got moved forward or up the ranks or didn't and why, you know, and we were able to represent that. It became a really significant part of the show and something that always kind of, um, you know, that we would be unpacking in those town halls because at the time, and it's still in the news, but you remember like a few years back when it was like a lot in the news and there was a lot of like legal um, policy stuff going on and that's kind of when our show hit. So um, it felt like a, a really interesting confluence of the time and, and then that sort of that workshop moment. Just to tag on to that and kind of harken back to what, if, what are some of the strategies? I think when we began it, particularly myself, I'm a civilian, right? And I don't have, a, I don't have many close relatives or friends that s have served. And so I was really on the outside of the military culture in a huge way and about as clueless. And my understanding of the military and the military culture is that you were all the same. Like, you know, probably you all joined for the same reasons, which, you know, Megan spent a lot of time and energy talking about where motive. Where, where motivation lies, like why did you join? But understanding the subtleties and the differences and the unique experiences that every single person we talk to, and so every time the show would begin or the, the stories would begin to tilt one way, making sure that we had the counterpoint story, do you know what I mean? So for someone that would tell us about their experience that was really challenging and really hard and how they hated what the military did to them, the next day I interviewed a major who talked about how equipping her service was and she would go back in a heartbeat. So I mean, I think, and one minute they would be saying how they, it was amazing and phenomenal and the next minute there would be tears pouring down their faces. They were talking about coming home and really looking for the commonality to steal your phrase, in people's experiences, good, bad, whatever, there are moments that they all started to kind of land on the same point as we were listening. I don't know if that's helpful. I don't know why that, but just popped up for me, I think, the different experiences and the different branches. You know, what we started to learn that I still keep saying to Megan, oh my gosh, we have to figure out a way to how to get that. Luckily, the production's pretty fluid, so we have opportunities, and I'm constantly asking her to rewrite and um, put the difference between the branches and how somebody from the Air Force speaks about somebody who's a Marine or how a Marine looks at, you know, and to the civilian world, that is just... The we, hierarchies. The hierarchies. The hierarchies. Yeah. 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 Helen, I think you're I, I just wanted, because I've heard this thing about commonality coming up and commonality in our trauma and... I think that is really key in our, what to me is the larger question, which is how do we deal with these wars that have happened? I, you know, a great wound has opened up our nation. And I think it's our job as artists, as storytellers especially, to somehow try to heal it or at least shed light on it. You know, ancient shamans took on the trauma, took on the pain in order that the community could transcend it. And I think that. I guess I'm, I'm saying how important I think this work that we're all doing is, and the trauma is the thing that unites us. The three communities that I was interviewing, who none of them would talk to each other, of course, um, and all wondered why we were interviewing the other communities. Um, but you know, the 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 young um, American um, soldier who suffers moral injury from pointing his gun over and over again at, at, at an Iraqi family, the 
um, Iraqi mother who tries to find a doctor to give her a, a C-section at the moment that Baghdad is in flames and bombs are going and she can't find a doctor. And the, 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 um, you know, the, the American who sees his friend or she sees her friend blown up by an IED that's planted in wounded dogs by insurgents. In, in all of those stories, very specific, it, they, they are all suffering trauma. And uh, I, I just feel really strongly that if we don't look at the, the, larger, the larger picture of trauma in these wars, um, we'll, we'll never come to terms with them. I mean, we're still doing World War II. We're still trying to figure that out. And we can't only talk to vets about it. We, st we certainly haven't even begun to deal with Vietnam. You know, so it's civil war. I mean, it, you know, these, these wars demand that we, um, we expand our context. Thanks for that prompt, Ashley, because it's something that's been on my mind um, since I got invited to this um, gathering, which is that some of these larger questions, actually going beyond your larger question, um, which have to, has to do with our society in general. And I, I think we have a culture of violence in this country, um, which is profound and um, not adequately discussed. And, and I just noted down some questions um, that I think I personally have been thinking about, and maybe others here will think about too, and, and I don't know how that gets expressed in our discussions about um, artistic representation, but let me just quickly just say them, because I wrote them down here. Um, why does our country spend more on its military than the next seven countries combined? Why are we permanently at war? Why are our police departments, as we saw in Ferguson at Standing Rock, increasingly militarized? Why, as Arthur de Grote noted in that HowlAround post last week, are nearly 230,000 veterans transitioning out of military service every month? Why does President Trump propose to boost the military budget by $54 billion and cut domestic programs by the same amount, including, yes, the National Endowment for the Arts? Why do a great many Americans feel comfortable with all of this? I, I don't think these are just political questions Oh, why, why do people feel, com why, do, why do a great many Americans feel comfortable with all of this? And I was going to say, these are not just political and social questions, they are moral questions. And as artists, you know, we, I think, want to investigate and interrogate moral questions. And I, I just want to put that out there. I don't know what to do with it, but I needed to say it. I'm going to give... Um Roman and then Marty, the, the final word. So there are two final words, and then we're going to uh, break back That's out. That's a lot of pressure. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the, a couple of things I've been thinking about and bouncing off of both of you, um, you know, when we started this, when I started this work, I definitely want, was looking at an impact on the audience from a couple of perspectives. I wanted to go into a theater, and I wanted to show the audience a war that they were not seeing on the televisions. I wanted them to feel the war that they, they weren't feeling, and I wanted them to, like, walk out feeling that they needed to do something or they needed to connect with a veteran or they needed to like advocate for a veteran. And so we, cr I created all of this work about, like you said, uh, trying to harness that emotion and, and use that emotion for good, um, question mark. Um, and then w I experienced two things which kind of made me transition a little bit. Um, one of them was the, the feeling of the audience after the show was just so heavy and so many people were asking so what's next and it forced it forced me to look at what's next and to create what's next and to start looking at that vision of of hope for the future um one of the works we now perform is a work created with the rocky youth that talk about hope in, in at past combat. Um, but going further, it, you know, where does that conversation go now? Bouncing off of your question, like now, it, you know, we've kind of encompassed this, this feeling of showing this war and showing this combat and, and then coming out of this, like, let's all like grow flowers and, and, and look at the sun all day and feel it on our skin. And then the reality of life, how do we connect the two of those? And I, 
and this is more of a question, something I'm investigating is how do we find kind of the, I'm gonna steal Liz for a second. You know, how do we take those two things and kind of turn them sideways? Great, Marty, final, final comments on final the inner, comments. Cir inner, inner circle. Uh, uh, I think the questions that have just recently been asked, you know, and issues are, are mine and all of ours as humans. I don't bring them into my work with vets at all. Um, except in, you know, it's like, what is the objective I have? Why am I doing this work? What are these questions I'm asking myself for these questions? I'm, you know, and so those are questions I think we're all, I mean, you said a good point. It was like, what's your, what's your motive? Um, so I don't, what I do do is work really hard to try to get, uh, vets there who, are asking themselves different questions. And so whether that's somebody from veterans who's decided to be a part of Veterans for Peace um, in Maine, whether that's, uh, you know, there's a, every vet is different. And so to, as in any piece, to try to get as diverse a particular group together and then how can I get out of the way and make way at the same time. Um, so. Great, uh, so thank you all. It was a great uh, conversation and um, uh, I really appreciate the um, honesty and uh, integrity in the conversation. So what we're gonna do uh, is you'll uh, go back to the outer circle and seats and then we'll just have an open conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, great, so uh, we've got some microphones um, uh, and uh, uh, people to pass them around to you. So uh, what are the things that you've been, uh, you active listeners in the outer circle? Uh, questions, comments, uh, thoughts that you're having uh, from that conversation? Uh, back, right back there, yeah. And if you would say your name uh, when you, um, uh, at the top, that'd be great. Um, sure. Uh, Jeremy Nobel, Foundation for Art and Healing. So maybe to continue as the outer circle, what I think was a really important dialogue that was happening in the inner circle. So, um, and I'll, maybe I'll make it personal as the people around the table did. By the way, I, I'm just it's so admiring of the work of the people around the table, so I wanted to thank them for that. So I'm a medical practitioner and a public health practitioner. That's one part of my world. And then I'm also an artist. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a poet. And when, when you think about the work and as people were describing it around the table, so I, I think it's incontrovertible at this point that creative arts expression improves health and well-being for individuals and community. Lots of ways it does that, growing evidence base to support it, and clearly that's underpinning a lot of that work. Then there's also an important question, which is the, from the aesthetic point of view, is the art being produced important art? Is it good art? And maybe it's what Roman said about taking Liz and the, like not making those dialectical questions, right, and turning them aside and, and have them be in dialogue with each other. Because there's no question in my mind that both important and good art is being produced in this setting and also it's serving a public health and a medical um, requirement, not even nice to have, but a need to have. And I'm just wondering about the thoughts of other people about how we continue having those perspectives be in dialogue because I think they're equally important. It's great. It's a great provocation for the room. Uh, somebody, uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Oh, great. Thank you. I got to hand it a mic. Um, Sam Pressler, Armed Services Arts Partnership, uh, ASAP. Um, don't have a direct response to that. I just wanted to make a few uh, quick notes, uh, particularly on key strategies. Um, so for context, we offer arts classes and workshops uh, for veterans, uh, service members, and their families as a means to help them reintegrate into their, their communities. Um, so we do stand-up comedy, improv, creative writing, storytelling. Um, I kind of wanted to hone in on the key strategies uh, perspective because I think it was very um, programmatic in the conversation, but maybe not as much tactical. And just like wanted to say a few tactical things that have been really 
helpful for us. So coordination is like something we don't think about, but like how do you think about engaging the veteran and military community? Um, and for us, what's been really helpful is forming relationships with the existing network of veteran and military service organizations in those communities. So having those lunchtime conversations with the leaders of those organizations so they build that trust with you to refer uh, their, their uh, members to your program. Um, working with the local VA hospitals, there are many, many social workers who are interested in this and open to it. Um, working with colleges, uh, their coordinators, their student veterans organizations, um, those are all really important outlets. And what we found is for our classes, we typically have 10 to 15 people in each class. Um, we typically get 30 to 45 applications for those classes. So we're seeing that the demand is really very much exceeding the capacity when you use those channels. Um, another thing that I didn't come up, but it maybe is implied, is training. So what are you doing to ensure that the practitioners are um, equipped to work with that population? I know trauma came up as one, so how are you training people to deal with trauma triggering situations, but also just more broadly like military cultural competency. And there are a lot of accessible trainings out there a really good resource that we use, and we partner with a group called Psych Armor. It's free online trainings on military and veteran cultural competency that I think if you feel like you may have a knowledge gap, um, our, our professionals have, have found that really useful. Um, the final thing I'll note on just programs is something that didn't come up, but accountability. Um, accountability for the instructors, but also accountability for the people coming to the programs. I, I think. Um, there's a inclination sometimes to treat veterans differently. Uh, I don't think that should be the case. I think these are people who've contributed and contributed at a very high level when they were in the service. And we should expect that in a, in a large way when they come to our program. So we ask them to commit to our classes. Uh, we say if you miss more than two classes, you're out. Um, and we call them if they're five, 10 minutes late. And we found that our graduation rates are between 90 and 95% through that class. So how do you create that culture of accountability um, within the program? And then just the final piece is like sustainability, right? And I think that's kind of come up, but there's a, been a lot in the art space about like, hey, we're gonna come do this workshop with you. But again, what is next? How are you either provide, linking up with resources in that community, providing that sustainability? Um, and so figuring out what those back-end partnerships look like, I just think is really important to do justice to the people that we're serving. So that's me. Great, thank you. Uh, here and back there. Uh, go ahead, okay. Margaret, and then we'll do back here. Uh, Margaret Lawrence, Dartmouth College. And um, this was just such a great conversation. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, I have a comment, but I also wanted to, I don't even think it's a counterpoint to what you just said about thinking about artistic quality. I really don't think about with the, this kind of work, I think about, you know, as a curator, I think about quality in a really different way, artistic quality. If I have an audience that looks like my other audiences, then I've failed for this kind of work. That's not who I want to necessarily see in the audience. I really need a different combination of people. And tied to that is the way that I think about quality. For me, quality has to do with engagement for this kind of work. I don't think about is somebody's turn out perfect. I don't think about, you know, is their diction perfect for, you know, like, those things help deliver the engagement, but it's the engagement that I'm really after. My question was going to be, um, really hearing this message about not, about sustainability, about building trust, which really takes time, about not being on that grant timeline. We all know those timelines, and I guess um, as more of a neophyte uh, with uh, you know, the kind of, uh, we'll talk later on a different round table, but the way that I engage with this work, I would say is periodically. I'm not a company that's founded primarily to do this work, so I do it as often as I can, but it's not consistent. Um, so are we at a place with the resources that exist where there's an understanding of that long trajectory that's needed, and if not, what can we do to get there? This thing on? Okay. There we go. Yeah, I'm that guy. Um, I, just, I rarely do this, but I'm actually going to echo that point. There's a lot of good, practical, tangible stuff, and the only thing that I want to kind of throw on there is that um, the military knows that the arts have practical value. Down at Maxwell Air Force Base, there is a uh, program where they set up one of those big faux villages 
and they bring uh, military members through there in um, kind of cultural awareness sensitivities. They bring groups through. You're supposed to try and uh, negotiate a first time in country situation, um, trying to negotiate like water rights when we did the, uh, the role play scenario. Then you debrief them afterwards, break it down, tell them, look, these are the things that kind of unite us as humans on this planet. This is, this is what you do. Um, so like you said, building those relationships, and if you need things to reference, look up, like find out what the military already uses in those ways and say, hey, we have this project or we have this program. And the thing that actually creates the issue, you know, being in the military and being kind of taken and controlled and put to do these things that normally people wouldn't want to do to each other. Um, by that same token, you can say, hey, you should then tell people to do these good things while they're still maybe on the out processing. Go approach these things at that point when you can force them to do it because they're going to be pains in the asses about it afterwards. Um, but yeah, just there are things out there. So if you need reference points, if you need stuff like that, it sounds like a fantastic reason. I'd love to touch base with you afterwards. Um, but there's stuff out there. So um, point out that it's already being done, which we should just do more of it. Hi, Scott Engel again. Um, I also forgot to say earlier that the views that I express are not the views of the DOD, but they are personally my own. Um, so I just want to make sure that caveat is out there. Um, I <laughs> so now I can start. Um, no, um, a couple of observations. You all have such a dilemma uh, in the art community. I'm not a non-artist, but um, to be able to venture into this space of trauma uh, and do so respectfully um, and not open up things that are inappropriate to open up. I mean, that is a very difficult task. Um, some concerns, you know, in terms of listening to some of the things that we heard earlier, um, I think one has to be very, very careful. Um, you are opening up the doors. You may not think you're opening the door, but that door is opening. And you also are striving to get very impactful information. You want to get stories. You want to get that emotional experience. So it is a very difficult dilemma to navigate with those service members. I think the most recent statistics are 22 service members active or, or, or prior um, commit suicide a day. Is it, is it higher than 22? Okay. It's still, an unex obviously, a very unacceptable number. So I think we have to be very mindful of the spaces that you travel with folks that are already taking great steps to come to your area. Because getting them out of the house and leaving the bunker, so to speak, is, is taking a great risk on their part. And so then to join a community and then sort of have certain questions delved into perhaps at a level that's maybe more clinical than it is not, I, I just would caution, and, and I would ask for wise thought in terms of how you pursue uh, digging further in your efforts to find impactful material uh, for your representations. Hi, um, Annie Hamburger, Ungar Arts, Space Track Live. Um, actually, one of the great strategies that I was able to employ is sitting here right next to me, Art DeGroat, who is this extraordinary human being who recognizes the value of the arts um, to affect social change and Art is a retired lieutenant colonel from the Army, 20 years in the service. And um, as a producer who's going to all these different places, it's very difficult because I don't live in a particular place where I'm bringing a performance. So how do you then help to ensure that those connections are valuable? And um, as a middle-aged Jewish woman, I can't be calling these military service organizations and have any kind of credibility. I wish that weren't true, but it absolutely is. And so we worked very closely with Art. Um, I mean, we went to 40 cities around the country. Um, and Art ha was tireless in terms of working with presenters, talking to presenters, giving them his point of view, asking presenters if they've reached out to a variety of different social service organizations, showing up at the performances wherever you can, giving guidance on who should be sitting on those panels, hoping that um, mental health professionals were actually sitting on those panels and were there to interact with people that opened up because he's got that cellular experience and the intellectual knowledge, recently got his PhD, um, to be able to really be an effective advocate and partner in the best of fashions as we went to all of these places in ways that I just couldn't, no matter how much I cared. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just add that uh, we, we talked a lot about, the artists talked a lot about um, their work for the purpose of healing and therapy, but uh, what, what the work we did with uh, Bass Track Live um, was more about civics literacy. Um, there's uh, only 0.4% of 
uh, of the nation's public since September 11, 2001, uh, served in uniform. So 99.6% of Americans have not directly involved in combat operations as a result of 9-11. So, so, so society doesn't understand the stories and the lives of their military service. It's particularly important today, since 1973, it became an all-volunteer thing. We heard the example of Civil War, everybody went to the war. Every male went to the war. Um, that's not the case now. So a very, very small minority of people of this millennial generation have made a choice to serve. And they did it exceptionally well, and now they're struggling to put their lives back together, find new meaning and new opportunities to become a citizen again. Um, so Base Track uh, was more of, of, of enhancing the non-veterans to understand who these people are. In this case, and you're going to see it tomorrow, you're going to see a story that's a story of, of two people that represents 4.1 million. And so I would just throw out there to the artists um, that are also presenting work that's not just therapy, but it's, it's civic or social literacy. If we're going to move past a, a, a sympathetic approach towards an apathetic approach, and we all know apathy is a better emotion to work with and learn and change than sympathy. I, it, it, it sucks to be you. It's not, not helpful to a veteran saying, hey, I now understand to some degree what you experienced, and I appreciate that, and what can I do um, to, to help uh, or make you part of my community? Um, we need that, and think, I think that's a calling for the artists, and I know Anne and others in the room have, are, are doing it for that purpose. So thank you for me share that. That's great. Yeah, go ahead down there. And then. Hi, uh, Bart Pitchford. Um, I, I want to piggyback on the, uh, on the tail end of that, um, because I think one of the important things that is often left out in this conversation, um, when we're looking at how do you reach across the lines between artist and, and military, because they seem so, so disparate and so, you know, so polar and, and, and far separated from each other, um, is first of all that it's not, right? There, there is a very, very uh, distinct commonality between the kinds of worlds that, uh, that theater people live in and the kind of world that military people live in. Um, I was theater and then I went into military and then I came out of the military and went back into theater. And what drew that through line for me is the, the teamwork, the structure, the, the knowing that as part of this team you have a specific function um, and that you are, you are as part of your function, you're serving the greater good of that team. Um, and so I think that there is a, a huge commonality within theater to draw, draw, uh, draw that into the veteran community. And part of why that's necessary, and this is, you know, this is where I, I want to piggyback on, on, on the tail end of this last discussion, is that all too often um, amongst my fellow veterans, what I hear is that when we do these programs, you know, it's always framed in the terms of, let me help you, let me help you, let me help you. And the fact is, is that most people that sign up in this all-volunteer army sign up to serve, sign up because they want to fulfill a valuable function. And so when they leave the military and they go into the civilian world and they're, you know, they're experiencing this, this cognitive dissonance that, you know, I'm in this structured world where I have this, this specific function and I'm, and I'm serving this value, now suddenly I'm in a world that has no structure, a world where I'm, I'm, I'm in a way functionless, and, and now not only do I maybe not see my value, but people are telling me that I don't have that value because they have to help me. And so my question then is, is can we reframe this in a way where, where it's, it's not about helping the veteran, but rather it's about the veteran helping to teach us right, and helping to teach the community and helping to bridge the gap of communication between the military and the community. So that's, that's what I have to say, thanks. Had, yes, did you have a comment? I thought I saw your hand up. No, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, got a couple, yeah. Madison and then Bill, yeah. Hi, Madison Cario. Um, I'm gonna jump right on that bandwagon because what I was thinking and what I was writing um, responding to you and to your note about um, art and healing and being careful and um, one of the roles that I think that art and artists have always have always done is um, not not so much 
with the goal to heal, but is to make the invisible visible, right? Which is what you're talking about. So it's, um, it's, it's on some level so much simpler. What we do is we, and there might be other journeys, but we're putting things on stage and you can see now, right? There's a face and it's not like, there's not one veteran, like there's no veteran culture, but you can go like, oh, like I tell you, when I stand up and I tell people I'm a veteran, they're like, huh, I never would have thought that. Or I tell them I'm an artist. Oh, yeah, I kind of can see that because of the hair. You know, but, but there's lots of stories, right? We all contain these invisible stories. They're gendered stories. There are all kinds of stories. And we share what we want to share when we feel comfortable or we're outed or whatever that journey is. So I think making the invisible visible is, is, is what we're doing. Healing can happen because of that. Empowerment can happen. Um, and then we start getting some real equity in the conversation. Thank you. That's great. Um, is this on? Yeah. Uh, so first I just want to say the NEA had nothing to do with the salty language in that poem earlier, so we're clear on that. Um, um, <laughs> so uh, a couple things. Um, I, one of the things that having worked in, uh, in the art sector for, I don't know, 20 years or so before I spent five years really working more in, in the areas where you guys are, um, it's a really difficult thing to separate out whether what we're doing is a focus on uh, healing um, or what we're doing is more focused on what I was trained to think of, which is let's examine the human experience in a way that allows us all to engage in, in a way so that we understand ourselves better and that we don't shy away uh, from the, um, you know, the things that were the subject of the beginning of the Western civilization where people came back from Pelop Peninsian Wars and wrote about it and processed it together in a big amphitheater. Um, and I think one of the things that's really interesting for me about um, the platforms that exist when you do bring people to these tables and aren't used to being there together is it creates a really unusual forum for what has really become a fragmented society to actually get around something together. And it doesn't matter how you voted uh, a couple months ago, you're all in it in the local community level. And that's a really healthy thing. <laughs> um, but I do want to touch in, we'll, we'll talk more about this tomorrow, but because we're really, you know, immediately after the art, our artist conversation here, um, I think there's two ways to be thinking of art making in the setting that we're talking about, especially if, if it has to do with trauma, whether you're looking at it as a society or as a person who's going through some journey. Um, they're not really diametrically opposed, but there are different rules that take place depending on who you're talking to and what the purpose is. Um, sometimes it is about healing. And if it is, make sure you know that that's what it is. And if that's the case, there are certain kinds of prompts and things that you do that, that can lead somebody on that journey that I definitely hear Marty has picked up on. And I think other people who spend time uh, who don't want to, you know, in the same way that um, in the military, I've heard a lot of people talk about how um, there's something very bizarre about the fact that we're trained to run towards the bullet. <laughs> and I think we're trained in college to run towards the Samuel Beckett and, and Eugene O'Neill trauma in a situation. And that's not always the best thing for the person that you're engaging. Um, but at the same time, I do think, and I really respond strongly to what you were talking about, sitting in a writing program for the past five years, I honestly do believe that um, there's something about the wartime experience that shakes us loose from the kind of, you know, the coma that we can walk through life in this 21st century way that we live it, that, uh, you know, rattles a cage, makes you rethink things very deeply so that uh, I know that a lot of the special operators who come through this writing program after having worked with playwrights who had gone through Brown, <laughs> which I'm sure had a different kind of PTSD instilled, but, um, <laughs> they have an unfair advantage at this work that we do. Um, and they do have something to teach us. And I think that puts on its head, and if we can recognize this, this notion of voyeuristic uh, window into their illness, um, which can be really patronizing and really kind of shallow. But if we recognize that they actually lived something that can tell us something about what a human being is, um, then we're all having, I think, a, a better conversation. That's great. Uh, Colleen over here, yeah. I, 
I just wanted to say um, two things, because we've been doing this work for over 23 years, and when you talk about consistency, I always ask the question to look back at your mission. And our mission is connecting communities, and the military is one of those communities, not separating it out and looking at it differently. And the other thing I'd like to include in the conversation is the notion of the military dependence, because you didn't go through that service alone. You went through it with your partners and your children. And those of you in the military know what canoe means. You know, your, your parent is there, and then the canoe is stable. Your parent leaves, the canoe's unstable. So you figure out how to ride it by yourself. Then the canoe gets stable again. And it was an ongoing cycle. So I'd like us to also include dependents in this conversation as well. That's great. Uh, is there a final comment? We're kind of wrapping up, but I want to make sure everybody, uh, yes. Did I see a hand? I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, Liz, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead, Liz, yeah, great. I just didn't see you back there. Thank you. Um, I, I didn't hear your name. You were introducing yourself as I walked in. Uh, both, I, I want to just say, uh, th during this, this round of working with people, um, I started thinking a lot about what was it that people were missing when they came back. And um, these are my words, not theirs. Risk, purpose, and love. And when I thought about that, I thought, well, that's why that, I'm addicted to risk, purpose, and love. That's why we do it over and over and over again. You know, we jump in again. So I really think that, the, the, and it, we are so fortunate to have that, all three of those things in combination. So I, the other comment I wanted to just think about is, do we say too, do we open too many doors? And I, I believe the artistic process in its fullness addresses that dilemma. And this is why our training is critical and why our strategy is intact and, and our consistency and constancy. Because of, um, a person may f fall apart. And we heard, pro we heard, I thought what Victoria said, and also the question uh, I, uh, the playwright with the guy scuttling and making him uncomfortable, that that's another way in which we've stepped over our line or something. But the artistic process, if we're practicing it, lets us go back in and go back in and go back in. Try it again, say it again, try it again. In our world, I often say, I, I put people entirely in charge of what it is that they're saying and doing and talking about. Whether it's the military or old people or children in a hospital, or people are amazing at what they will choose to say, when they choose to say it. But if this happens, I don't know that they've gone too far. It's that sometimes we're afraid to feel it, hold it, be with it. So the last comment I just want to say about that is someone said to me, this man who lost, whose brother was a triple amputee, said, so Liz, I'm not going to come see it unless you promise me something, somebody's healed. If I don't see somebody healed in your piece, I'm not coming. Does anybody get healed? And I said to him, give me 24 hours. I got to go think about this. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And then I came back with exactly this thing about artistic process. I said, if you mean, does the per does, do people get over it and, they never, and they're done with it? No. No one will get healed. But if you think people may be seen living with it, partnering it, coming back to it, trying this way, try well, yes, actually, yes. And that got, so there's somewhere in your notion, this question about the evolution of these things and how we handle that evolution that I think goes to your very important question about how we're working. Uh, I, I just want to thank everyone. Uh, this was a great uh, conversation, and I think it launches us. We're going to have a lot more opportunity uh, both to hear from specific uh, folks and then also to talk together as a large group. So tomorrow will be um, quite full of uh, that. And so, um, uh, Jamie, do you have... Uh, some next steps for us? That I do. Um, so it is 5.45, we're on time, yay. And uh, we're gonna go have dinner together, which is really exciting. Um, and the place we're going is a short walk from here. It's about four blocks, if I had to ballpark it. Um, and Carl and David and Jane and the folks from NIFA are going to lead that party walking 